so for the first order logic we had seen the semantics then came to calculations informal proofs and then developed the uh, proof by resolution technique the next in the sequel should be our axiomatic system and the axiomatic system we will call it as fc first order calculus and this will be an extension of the propositional calculus we already had so that means the three axioms and the inference rule mp will be kept as they are and we have to add certain more things because of the quantifiers again for the quantifiers we will take only one quantifier for each x because the other one can be introduced with a definition by using the not de morgan's rule we have right so like if you have there is x x you can introduce it as a definition uh, with not for each x not x right just the way we have introduced the connectives by definitions the same way we can go for the quantifiers so but we have to take care of the special predicate equality predicate that might give you some axioms or inference rules something we have to introduce there so these are the extra things we need for fc so let's start with fc so again our axioms will be axiom schemes so we are not using there exists symbol so that means we have uh, the alphabet we will have only these symbols for each and then uh, not and implies okay these two are the connectives and this is only the quantifier and then we will also use the equality predicates okay all the other things like predicates terms variables they are as they are only restriction will be up to this okay this along with predicates function symbols and so on okay so we'll start with the axiom schemes the axiom schemes of fcr as follows so here we will be using x as a variable then we have st for terms and x y z for formulas so with this we will have the axioms first one will be our earlier axiom for pc so that will be x implies y implies x okay next a2 is the distribution of implication which is x implies y implies z implies x implies y implies x implies z just like your pc then we have a3 which is for the negation sign so not x implies uh, not y implies not x implies y so that should give us x right law of contradiction then we have the other axioms peculiar to fc so first we will take the quantifier form for each x x implies x x by t so now you are giving something like universal specification but then this term t there are some restriction on it fine that this what was the restriction can you recollect with extend the uh, universal specification yeah so that means x should be free for the term t x is not only free x should be free for t so right provided x is free for t in x okay 
next we have another for implication sign itself. So, for each x let us write y, y implies z implies y implies for each x z. Here again this is not a valid formula for every y, but it is valid when x does not occur in y. Right? So, let us write it provided x is not free in y. Okay. Then we should have something for the equality. So, let us write say t is always equal to t. Okay, so reflexivity and next we will have s equal to t implies if you have x s then we should get x t. Fine. So, substitutivity is remaining in the formulas that is what we want. think that should do. Then we will have the inference rules of F c. So, as earlier we will take modus ponens which says x, x implies y therefore, y and then universal generalization that is from x you can conclude for each x x, but there is again a problem always you cannot infer from p x you cannot say for each x p x right it will allow something wrong. So, what should you have is x should not be free in the premises right. So, in fact when you come across the proofs if it is not occurring at all in any premise if that might be a bigger constraint. What we need exactly is till now whatever premise has been used x is not free there then there is no problem right. So, we will just write provided x is not free in any premise used thus far. Right, that must should be sufficient. Then as earlier we will be introducing theorems, proofs, right, consequences and so on. So, first thing is we should define what a proof is. Right. So, as earlier a proof will be a sequence of a finite sequence of formulas okay, where each of the formulas occurring in that sequence should be either an axiom or it follows from earlier formulas by application of inference rules. Right. So, for M p when you apply you need two such formulas earlier two formulas when you apply u g you will need only one formula right. So, it should follow from that. So, follow from means whatever is in the denominator numerator must be there in the proof already denominator should be we will be telling that it is derived from that or it follows from that that is what a proof is. Next we should define what a theorem is. So, as earlier again a theorem is the last formula of a proof fine we are going so formal it looks funny, but that is what it is. So, theorem is simply the last formula of a proof. Next we will be introducing uh, consequences or rather probability of consequences. So, for consequences we will again take sigma is a set of formulas. and x is a formula. So, we will write sigma n tells x in f c now. So, this f c often we will omit once we know that we are working in f c. So, sigma n tells x uh, if 
uh, if there is a derivation of x using formulas from sigma. So, the formulas in sigma are again called the premises and what is the derivation? Just like your proof, you will be having a derivation. So, again derivation is a finite sequence of formulas, where each formula is either an axiom or it is a premise, it is a formula from sigma or it is derived from earlier formulas. Right? So, similarly this symbol can be used for the theorems. Right? So, without anything on the left side, which means now a derivation is a proof without any premise, it allows that. Right? Then we will introduce also inconsistency. We will say that sigma is inconsistent if for some formula x we have both sigma entails x and sigma entails not x. Right. So, that means, we have a derivation for sigma entails x, we have a derivation of sigma entails not x. Otherwise, we will say that sigma is consistent. Fine. So, here really inconsistency is nicely defined, consistency is not because consistency says that it cannot be derived whatever x you choose either x cannot be derived from sigma not x also cannot be derived or one of them can be derived the other cannot it is difficult to show right but inconsistency maybe you can show it you can demonstrate it by having two derivations one for sigma entails x one for sigma entails not x Okay. So, we will see some examples how the proofs go there. Okay. Now, this is a familiar theorem. Yes, the first theorem in PC we proved was this P implies P. So, you can use the same proof exactly here also that will prove for each x x implies for each x x. Right? But here with quantifier axioms and quantifier rules, we can have a different proof also. So, let us try that how it goes. Okay. Okay. First is you may say for each x, x implies x. Which axiom is it? Huh? See, provided x is free for t in x, so I can take t equal to x itself. So x is free for x in x. Now then, this becomes x itself. There is no change. X is substituted by x. So, it is simply f 4. Okay. Next, we will go for, for each x, x implies x implies for each x, x implies for each x, x where from it comes. Just check it. Say y is your x. Huh? Y is you have to take for each x. So what we need is 
this is suppose I take for each x, x, this is x, then I would get for each x, x here, for each x, z here, right. Condition is x is not free in y. So, suppose I take y as for each x, x, then x is not free there, right, but it needs one for each x here, that is the only thing, right. So, let us put it. Fine. Now it's all right. So this is a five. Okay. Next, we want this one so that we can apply MP, and this can follow from this by UG because there is no premise used. So it says the restriction on UG is that the variable x should not have been free in any premise used till now. No premise has been used, right? So it can always be used. So third line we may say for each x, for each x x implies x. This comes from one by u g. Is that okay? Then fourth is by modus exponents for each x x implies for each x x. Okay, let us take some more example to see something which is not in P C. This is really coming from P C this theorem. Okay. It is P implies P though we have a different proof now instead of using just P implies P from fine. So, this is your familiar rule of renaming. You have say P x or P y here for each y P y should entail for each x P x, right? Y has been substituted by x. Fine? Yeah. So, what is the condition? x is not free in x. Right? We may say better one, let us say x does not occur in x, then provide that x does not occur in x. Suppose this is given, fine, it should be all right. So, let us see a derivation. So, again we will not be fussy about writing derivation or a proof, we will just write proof, we may write a derivation. Now, we can use this as a premise, that is what it says and then finally, we should have for each x, x y by x. So, let us write that as a premise first. Now, Which one? We should choose a for in which form? For each y, x implies x y by x because that is what we want, right? So x is your term t now, which satisfies the condition required there. The variable y should not be free; should be free for x. Right? It is free for x because x does not occur at all. Fine. So this is your a for. Then you have modus ponens which is x, y by x. Then u g. That's the natural thing. And u g is applicable. Constant is x should not occur free in for each y x that is the only premise used right it is not free because it does not occur okay
you can interchange the quantifiers. Okay, this should be easy to go. All that you need, get x and then go on generalizing. Right? So we start with our premise for each x for each y x. Second, we go for for each x for each y x implies for each y x x is substituted by x that is all right. So, this is allowed by f of okay. next we conclude for each y x by mode exponents next again for each y x implies x a for next mode exponents. Now, we slowly generalize. So, 6 for each x x u g it is allowed because in the premise x is not free variable x is not free that is the only premise we have used. Then again for each y for each x x u g well we can start with the premise always for each x not x that is a premise. Then we can say not x because this is an axiom yeah a for is that right. Then mode exponents gives not x now from not x we want to infer not for each x x no axiom says that right no inference rule is there fine but we can always infer from for each x x x can you see some relation between this see you have not x you want to infer from this not for each x not x no it is not for each x x you want to infer this right. So, look at the other side can you infer this for yeah by a 4 this is really a 4 and m p fine now what is the relation between this and this. So, this implies this, this implies this. Contraposition, we can always use PC theorems because it is an extension, right. If you do not want to use the theorem, you have to duplicate its proof, that is all, fine. So, let us use PC theorem, which is contraposition. Now, with contraposition, which one we want? Uh, for each x. X implies X. This is an axiom. Okay. Next, we say for each X, X implies X implies not X implies not for each X, X. Okay. This is contraposition. We'll just write as theorem. It's already proved in PC. Right. We have already proved it as a theorem. If you want to find what is the name, you say contraposition. Fine. Next, by modus ponens, we reach not x implies not for each x x. Next, use not x and modus ponens. Okay. So, I am not writing again 6, it is the previous line. So, only remote line I am writing as 3. So, 3, 6 modus ponens gives not for each x x. Now, let us take one more example. So, 
suppose you take this which looks very simple but we don't have any axiom for it we don't have an inference rule okay symmetry of the equality relation so anyway we'll start with the premise next a7 in which form well again a7 if you look along with mp see it will be easier to think about the consequences that's why you think always with mp instead of the axioms suppose a7 a seven, I can think of this as a consequence this way. Okay. If I have already s equal to t, I have already x of s, then I can infer x of t. Intuitively, that is what a seven says. Okay. Now, by application of MP twice. Okay. Now we want to find out that t equal to s is inferred. So our x t should be t equal to s right so x should be equal to s equal to s right but if you say see there is a problem writing in this form giving the problem if you write in the correct axiom form it should not suppose i write this as x x by s and this is x x by t right so now you can think of x as x as x equal to s fine so the axiom way we are writing x x by s is not exactly x of s because you cannot substitute s by t directly you have to substitute by a variable and that gives also freedom you can substitute partially right is that okay so we start with our x as uh, or rather axiom 7 in the form s equal to s hmm, s equal to t implies x equal to uh, s implies x equal to t right this is the axiom we want so this x will become now this is s this x will be substituted by t that is what we want is it right so this x we are going to substitute by s so we start with this form of the axiom is it clear so to give a comment to make it readable you may say a7 x equal to x equal to s that's all that will make it readable right Okay, so next we go for modus ponens. Next we introduce s equal to s. This is a six, and again by modus ponens t equal to s. So this is how we'll be doing the proofs and the derivations. Then immediately we should go for the meta theorems, which should be helpful for us. Right, that is how we saw in PC. Okay, Let us formulate monotonicity. So, we start with two sets of formulas, one of them is a subset of the other, and then we have another formula. If C 
sigma entails x then gamma entails x also we add another form if hmm? well we go the other way right or you can write it as if gamma is consistent then sigma is consistent fine but we will be proving this we will be proving this fine so now how do we prove first one there is nothing to prove really it's the same proof as pc right because there is a derivation is the definition of the theorem itself definition of the consequence itself similarly this one also one sigma is inconsistent there is sigma entails x sigma entails not x so by first one gamma is inconsistent okay second one implies first one that will come only after redux or epsilon first one implies second is easy okay now let's go to reduction theorem So this will say, uh, let sigma be a set of formulas. Then you need two formulas at least, x y formulas. Then sigma union x entails y if and only if sigma entails x implies y. Okay. So one part of this should be easy. Just an application of MP. Suppose sigma entails x implies y. Right? Then there is a proof of it. So take that proof. So call it P one. It starts as one something and some m, which gives x implies y. So all the premises are used in sigma only. Fine. Next, you introduce x, which is a premise. Okay. So now you have used premises from sigma union x, and then m plus two is y by modus ponens. That's all. So this sets. Sigma union x entails y. Just an application of MP. So that means sigma entails x implies y gives sigma union x entails y. The other part we have to show now. Assuming sigma union x entails y, so that sigma entails x implies y. So if you remember, we had done the proof by induction. Right? The same method will be used here again. But then why repeat? There is something, something extra here, right? So let's see that. Say we proceed with our assumption: sigma union x entails y. Our aim is to show that sigma entails x implies y, right? Now, since sigma union x entails y, what could be this y? Things, y is an axiom. Second is y belongs to sigma. Third is y equal to x. So it belongs to sigma union x, right? Fine. Anything else? Anything else? How can this come? That's what our problem. How can y follow from sigma union x? So there is a proof of y. That's what it says, right? So let's take one simpler case. Say there is a proof of sigma entails y. X has never been used. First, let's take that case. Some way it has been derived where x has never been used, right? 
So, next case we will take x has been used in the proof, right. So, x has been used in the proof. proof of sigma union x and tells y. In this case, how the y follows from sigma union x. So, y can follow because of all these things anyway, we are not using that. It can follow by application of some inference rule, right. So, it can follow by an application of MP or it follows by an application of UG. Right. So, and MP has been used. And the last case is X has been used in the proof of sigma union X and tells y and u g has been used. These are all the cases we can follow. Fine. In each of these cases we should show that sigma and tells x implies y. Fine. Now, let us see first case a y is an axiom. Then how do you say sigma and tells x implies y? We want x implies y, not y. See, our aim is to show that sigma and tells x implies y. Hmm? So, this is our aim to show that sigma and tells x implies y, right. So, you need axiom 1, you need axiom 1 here, right. So, case A, we give a proof of sigma and tells x implies y. So, start with y axiom, some axiom, which one we do not know. Next, y implies x implies y, A 1, therefore, x implies y by modus minus, ok. So, this is a proof of sigma and tells x implies y. Even sigma has not been used, so it does not matter, not that everything has to be used. Next case B, y belongs to sigma, same proof instead of axiom, uh, if it is B, you will be writing here premise for B, everything else remains as it is. Right. For A, you proceed like this. For B, instead of axiom, you write P. It is a premise. Then also, it says sigma enters x implies y. Clear? Now, let us take case C. Y equal to x. X implies x is a theorem. Right. Hence, by monotonicity. We do not need monotonicity, right. But since we have proved, let us mention, ok. Next case D sigma and tells y. What to do here? Just like this, case B, just like case B, right. If sigma and tells y, then you have another proof of up to this line y, where only premises from sigma is used, then add this to that proof, right. So, add the proof in A to the proof of sigma and tells y, right. You have sigma and tells y, so already up to this you have the proof. Right? Y is the last line of that proof sigma and tells y. Then continue this way 
you get sigma inverse x implies y that is all. Next case now we will need induction it has been obtained by MP suppose it has been obtained by MP. So, you have a proof where y has been obtained right and you have sigma union x where x has been used really right that is the case. Now, once y has been obtained by M p you have another formula z implies y before it. So, that M p has been applied fine is that ok next next use the induction hypothesis on this right use the induction hypothesis you are proving it by induction on the proof of sigma union x enters y right. So, now this says sigma union x enters z implies y that is what it shows. Okay. Then by induction hypothesis you have sigma enters x implies z implies y is that ok. But then since you have applied M p you also have z before it somewhere right. So, apply again on that you get sigma enters x implies z. Now, add to this proof add to the proofs of this and proofs of this right. So, suppose this has been proved by P 1 this has been proved by P 2 then what you do take P 1 next take P 2 this proofs. So, here the last line is x implies z implies y here the last line is x implies z next apply axiom 2 implies x implies z implies x implies y apply mode exponents twice once you get this one next time you use this you get this one. So, you get x implies y that is all. So, this step is by induction on the length of the proofs of sigma enters sigma union x enters y fine it is just mimicking the same proof as in proportional calculus. So, now we are in case f fine you have a proof of sigma union x enters y where u g has been used. Again the proof will be by induction right. So, you have a proof where you have obtained y by universal generalization. So, that means y must be in the form for each x some z some x right because u g has been used. So, then you have z somewhere here on which you have applied and this x is not free in x in all the premises, but x has been used right. So, it is not free in x all these information are there ok x is used somewhere and it is not free in x fine. Now, what we do apply induction hypothesis. So, then you get sigma entails z with x right. So, you have sigma entails x implies z ok. Now, sigma entails x implies z. So, from this by u g you get x implies z with for each x fine all that we need is x should not be free in the premises and x is not free in the premises it is not free in the x nowhere else right. So, for each x x implies z then use the axiom for each x x implies z implies x implies 
for each axiom which axiom is it a 6 or a 5 hmm? a 5 and condition is x should not be free in x that is what it is fine then use modus ponens you get x implies for each x z that is all and x has never been used in this proof right. Okay. So, that is the end of the proof of deduction theorem. We will slowly go to other meta theorems.